This is a shooting gallery I made. You know the sort that you get at fun fairs and you knock over the targets and if you get them all down the guy hands you a prize like this adorably cute teddy bear. And I thought this would be a pretty fun prop to use in an escape room. Doesn't have to be fun fair themed, this could be a wild west shootout or perhaps defending yourself against a horde of zombie or alien invaders. But for this to work, I needed a way that players would be given the prize automatically when all the targets had been knocked down. And so this is what I came up with. Uh, first of all, I'm going to take my prize teddy and I'm just going to secure him into the latch at the end here. So just push him in there like that. So he's now attached there. And then I need to take my weapon. You could use uh, a Nerf gun, you could use ping pong balls or other balls. Uh, I'm going to use uh, rubber bands like this and I'm just going to try and knock them all down. So let's see how this goes. That's a good start. Uh, less good. Now keep your eyes on the prize if I can hit this final target. And there goes Ted on the floor. I can now go and claim my prize. So to explain how this works, let me show you this view from behind the targets. So I've got my four targets lined up in a row. Uh, they're all identical, so I can explain how simply this one works nearest to the camera. So the paddle of the target itself, this is cut out of five and a half millimeter plywood and it's simply mounted onto a very simple hinge at the base here that allows it to move backwards and forwards. Now I've got a switch at the back here. This is the limit switch, which is activated when the target falls backwards. And there's a switch behind every target and these are simply wired together in series. But there's two 3D printed parts I'm using here as well. And I just want to explain their function in a bit more detail. The first one is this one on the front of the paddle here. And this has got sort of two purposes really. The first one is to prevent this hinge from allowing the paddle to fall forwards at all. I only want it to fall from an upright position here and then backwards onto the switch. So the block here kind of extends forwards, it prevents it falling forwards, but also I want to be able to adjust the resistance of the target. I want it to stay upright. I don't want it to be so flimsy that it just falls over, you know, when a gust of wind comes past or if players are a bit rough with a prop or something like that. But I also want to make sure that it does fall over when it's hit by whatever projectile you are using. And depending on whether you're using a rubber band or a tennis ball or something, obviously that force is going to be quite different. So I wanted to make something adjustable. And the way I've done that, so I've got this, this block here that I 3D printed, it's got screws that come through from the back of the hinge to the front, and then I can attach a different number of nuts onto the end, or I can actually adjust the size of that block itself. Basically, I can weigh this down. If I really wanted this to have more resistance, you can actually mount a magnet on the front here and have this uh, another fixed magnet on the board here that was holding it in place. And that's going to be something that differs on every single build. I say depending on how far away the players are, what it is they're throwing, how uh, lots of other factors. But I wanted to make that easily adjustable. So that's the first 3D printed element there. There's no reason this has to be 3D printed. You could put a block of wood on the front, you could put a bit of metal, but you're going to want something that lets you adjust that resistance to falling over. And the second 3D printed element is the housing, which is holding up the limit switch here. So this is also providing two functions really. First of all, it's actually making sure that the limit switch is positioned in the right place. I'm using a distance of about five centimeters uh, behind the hinge here and that means that as the target falls back it engages nicely with the switch. But when these are knocked over they actually are knocked backwards with some force um, like that. And these limit switches, they are designed for use in machinery that uh, activate them, but they're generally, you don't want to take the whole force repetitively of these targets knocking into them, because I think that would probably damage the switch. So what these are designed to do, and hopefully I'll be able to show you this, is as the target falls backwards, uh, if I can get my camera to focus on the right point, basically it falls backwards just sufficiently far 
to activate the switch but then the full force and the full weight of the target is supported on the back of the mount here so it, it never actually um, sort of forces the switch all the way down it just falls far enough to engage it and then it is stopped by this block at the back so this is kind of like a, a safety mechanism as you were just to make sure that the switch engages but that it is uh, protected a little bit from the full force of the target falling on it. Now, these uh, limit switches have got three outputs. Uh, they've effectively got a common pin that is connected between the normally open and a normally closed, and they are wired together in series to form a circuit so that only when all of the switches are activated, when all the targets have been knocked down, this forms a continuous circuit that goes onto the back of the board. And this is where the circuit from those limit switches comes into the board. You'll see that it is connected to a relay module here. Now I'm using uh, an automotive relay, but you could just use uh, one of these blue box star relays if you're more familiar with those instead, that's not that important. And what the relay does is that when the circuit is closed, it activates the relay allowing it to switch the common pin between normally closed and normally open. That's the blue and green wires here. And that effectively diverts a 12 volt uh, power supply, which is coming in through this cable here. Normally, the normally closed one powers the LED lights on the, on the front of the target gallery. But when it's activated, when all these switches are closed, instead that 12 volt power is diverted through to the mag lock at the back here. When activated, this ejects the catch, which is holding onto the teddy at the front. So simultaneously, when the switches are all closed, the lights go off and the mag lock is released. This is a fail secure style mag lock, which is one of the style that only wants to be energized for a brief pulse of time. You don't want to continuously activate this. So I'm using the feedback wires here to ensure that once it's ejected, the power is then cut again. It's a little bit hard to explain here, so let me show you a wiring diagram. So essentially, we've got three different circuits here. Here we've got the control circuit. So at the base, I've got a DC power supply, and that's connected to the common terminal of the first limit switch. Then the normally open terminal of that switch is connected to the common terminal of the next switch, and so on. And you can continue this pattern to add more and more limit switches, one for each of however many targets you want in your shooting gallery. Now you connect the normally open terminal from the last limit switch to one of the coils of the relay. And then you connect the other coil of the relay back to the power supply. Now, I'm using a 12 volt relay, so this is a 12 volt power supply. If you were using a 5 volt relay, this would be a 5 volt supply instead. And so here we've got a circuit, but because it goes through the normally open terminals, it's broken at each of these switches. To complete the circuit, they need to be pressed all at the same time and this allows current to flow from the power supply to energize the relay. Now, the relay is a switch that connects the common terminal here, coming from the power supply on the left, to either of these two pins on the right. Now, in its default state, it's connected to the normally closed pin up here. So this makes a complete circuit here to the LED light on the front. Now, when the control circuit at the bottom is activated though, the common pin is switched across to the other normally open terminal. And this diverts the power here to this circuit that goes to the mag lock instead. This ejects the catch, which is secured onto the prize. So this little catch is sewn onto the back of Teddy's jacket in my case. Now, once the catch has been ejected, we need to stop that power supply though. If we leave it powered on, the mag lock will burn out. So the style of cabinet lock I'm using has this additional pair of feedback signal wires. 
And these are only connected when the cat has been inserted in place. So I've wired the circuit from the relay through those two feedback wires and that's going to prevent damaging the lock. Now if you want more information about this kind of wiring, I've made a previous video that explains all about how cabinet maglocks and other styles of maglock work, so I'll let you refer to that. Now it's important to note that both the maglock and the lights on the front run at 12 volts and that means they can share the same power supply here. If you're using a 12 volt relay, as I am, you can actually use that same power supply for the control circuit as well. And so all the components on the board are now running from a single power supply. Now, the reason I have shown this diagram with them being separate though, is to highlight the fact that electronically speaking, these are separate isolated circuits. And that's important because Generally speaking, you wouldn't want to place delicate micro switches like this directly in line with a power supply to a component such as a maglock. Maglocks draw a reasonable amount of power and particularly they have a sudden inrush of current when they're first activated. Now if you had these little switches in series with the maglock circuit, all that current would pass through them too and that can cause the metal contacts inside the switch to fuse shut. So the, uh, the switches will become sticky over time and unresponsive. Now whereas in this circuit they are only placed in a series circuit with the relay, not with the maglock. Now you could isolate them even further still by using transistors or by reading the state of each switch individually from the GPIO pin of a microprocessor. But I wanted to keep this circuit as simple as possible and this should work fine for most cases. So that brings me to the end of this video. Um, this is a pretty nice straightforward build to be honest. You could definitely do this in a weekend. It only cost about $25 in components and the majority of that is the maglock and the relay. The rest of it really is just uh, small components that you can get from any hardware shop and you can assemble it very easily at home. Now obviously I've designed this with an escape room in mind but you could also use this for a school fete or a community event, anything like that. You could theme it to have different characters on the paddles or to be positioned at different heights. So long as when they are knocked over they knock into those switches behind them you can basically arrange this in any kind of configuration you want. As always I will upload the files for the cutouts I used, the wiring diagram, any 3D models that I printed over onto my Patreon account and if you'd like to download any of the resources from the escape room projects in this channel they are all available over there so please do head over there and check it out if you're interested. Otherwise I just want to say on behalf of Ted and myself I wish you a very Merry Christmas and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay cheers, bye.